Hello everyone, we are now joined by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA Group Lead, Swadhi Mohan, Navigation and Control System. One uh, personal question, what drew you to space science? You are an, a renowned uh, aerospace engineer. What brought you to this field? So I was first interested in space by watching a TV show called Star Trek The Next Generation. And I remember seeing the images of space, the nebula, the blues and purples and greens. It was so beautiful and so different than anything here on Earth. And I learned then that the premise of the show was that we fundamentally don't know what's going on elsewhere in the universe. There's parts of the, the galaxy and the universe that we we don't know what's happening. The physics could even be different. And that really sparked my curiosity, the mystery of it, the fact that we, there are areas that we just didn't know about. I didn't know what being an engineer was, but after I took my first physics class, then I started to understand what it meant to build things in support of space exploration. So that's when I became passionate about doing that. I ended up at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory working in the guidance and control section, which is like the eyes and ears of a spacecraft. It helps you figure out where you are, where you need to go and how to get there based on the mission that you're trying to do. There are so many fascinating aspects that have been unveiled during your research on Cassini, Mars 2020 and several other missions. Can you please throw some light on it? I've worked on a lot of different missions uh, to many different objects in the solar system. I worked on Cassini for just one year uh, as a very lowly engineer, um, but it was the, the year that Cassini reached Saturn. So it was a beautiful experience to see these images. Our knowledge of them was just very blurry pixels and then suddenly see these high resolution images really felt like it captured the spirit of exploration to unlock these new worlds. The next mission that I worked on was GRAIL. It was the first time we had flown two spacecraft in formation around another planetary object. This was to map the gravity of the, the lunar surface. The next mission that I worked on uh, was a telescope mission that actually didn't, um, didn't actually get to be built, but it was an interesting concept of how we would assemble telescopes in space. And then an Earth orbiting mission uh, to detect carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then finally, I was on the Mars 2020 mission for eight years from the very early formation of the team to landing day. Uh, and through that mission, I learned a lot and was able to design and create, build, test, and operate. Um, after landing day, I actually have done another mission called Psyche, which is a mission to a metal asteroid that was just recently launched in October of last year. So there must be several things that you came across while uh, studying the data that have been sent by these spacecrafts. Please share something about that. So each spacecraft has its own particular mission and science objectives. Uh, for example, the Mars 2020 mission, its purpose was to find the signs of past life on Mars. As such, its job was to be the first leg of Mars sample return to collect samples that we could one day bring back to Earth. Uh, the question of whether there's signs of past life on Mars is a, a very profound question. So we want to make sure absolutely that we are confirmed with the answer, which means we need the full arsenal of the resources we have here on Earth. Perseverance, though, has been able to successfully collect uh, about 23 samples on Mars. It's been there now for uh, over three years, and it has uh, two different depots of samples, one that it's put on the surface and one that it's carrying with it. So these samples were getting ready to do the next mission to bring these samples back. Um, in addition, Perseverance had some technology demonstration that helps future exploration. Uh, one was terrain relative navigation that helped us land safely on Mars. Um, and the second was an instrument called um, MOXIE, which uh, proved that we could convert carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere into oxygen, which is, if we want humans to eventually go to Mars, is a very critical technology to uh, generating our oxygen in situ. Uh, Perseverance also had a, a friend ride along with it called the Ingenuity a helicopter, which is the first time that we've actually had aerial mobility on Mars, and this allowed us to, uh, to open up a whole new platform of exploration. Several interesting things you shared about uh, Mars 2020 mission. Do you foresee any, you know, a timeline of uh, man having his own uh, settlement there, for at least for uh, uh, scientific uh, studies? I 
really can't foresee what it would take to do manned exploration. I can just say that uh, we're working on technology to support that. The two technologies that I mentioned, the terrain relative navigation, which helps pinpoint landing on Mars, and MOXIE are two examples of how uh, we're supporting eventual manned exploration to be able to land where we need them to and to be able to generate our own oxygen. These are but two examples of technologies that we need for eventual manned exploration. There's a, a host of other technologies that we would need also and um, where different agencies are working on. So the distance between Earth and Mars is so huge, it takes uh, uh, months to, go there to reach uh, the surface of the Mars and uh, to come back. So how do you see the challenge? So the, the distance between Earth and Mars has uh, a couple of different challenges. Uh, one, just to get from Earth to Mars, the shortest path uh, only comes when the planets are aligned. This is actually when we targeted to send the Perseverance spacecraft because every 24, 26 months, Mars and Earth are aligned to make that shortest distance. Even with that, it's over 300 million miles, about six and a half months that it took for Perseverance to get from Earth to Mars. Uh, not just is the, the time to get there long, but their distances are far enough apart that it takes light uh, somewhere between 11 and um, over 15 minutes to travel uh, one way between Earth and Mars. And this makes communication very difficult because the round trip time between when you ask a question and when you can get a response is sometimes like 22, 25 minutes. Uh, so for something as time critical as landing, it has to be done completely autonomously because there's not enough reaction time in order to account for that distance between uh, Earth and Mars. Do you think uh, Moon can be a launch pad for a further journey towards outer space? I don't know of any plans or any progress to do that. I can just say that uh, getting stuff off the surface of Earth is very challenging because of the gravity. So the bigger that we need to take off the surface of Earth, uh, the harder it is to get out of the gravity well. Uh, the moon has the benefit that it's a smaller body, so getting off the surface, um, just in terms of fighting gravity, is uh, a little bit easier. So there's some benefit to being able to do that, but I couldn't speak to any plans of actually creating that. There are several uh, international uh, cooperation agreements, especially with uh, NASA and ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization. Please throw some light on it. So collaboration is key in enabling these large complicated missions for uh, space exploration. The more challenging the mission, the more we need to, to collaborate. Uh, one example of collaboration between NASA and and ISRO is the NISAR mission. It's called the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. And this is a great example of actual uh, equitable collaboration. You know, ISRO developed one aspect of the payload that went to JPL and NASA. They integrated into the other part of the payload. That integrated system came back to ISRO to get integrated into the spacecraft. So it's an actual very um, equal partnership. Uh, the NISAR mission is an Earth orbiting satellite, which will help us um, take measurements of the, the Earth's surface in different areas and help um, provide some context for climate change here on Earth. The government-led research in the private sector, the private sector has uh, an agility that the government doesn't nearly have, and the government has a resource that the private sector doesn't have. It's when they work together that will allow uh, collaboration and um, make creating efficiency in the space program that uh, hopefully will enable access uh, to multiple different organizations at different levels, like um, small low-cost launchers or small satellites uh, can enable missions at a much cheaper environment that can allow um, many other nations and, and organizations to participate. Today being the International Women's Day, uh, what advice you would like to give to uh, the young students who are aspiring to become space scientists and space engineers, especially the girl students? So women in STEM in general and space engineering in, in particular, women have made great contributions. Uh, the percentage of women uh, in STEM is still something that could be worked on, especially in the very heavy math and, and STEM fields. We're still uh, not at, at gender equality. And I think this represents a huge untapped potential in the women workforce, that if we can encourage this workforce, we can have more diverse teams. The reason diverse teams are 
are important is because they allow different perspectives and different viewpoints. Uh, these different perspectives are critical to being able to come up with efficient, elegant solutions that we need in order to solve the more complicated problems. So today on International Women's Day, we take a moment to recognize the, the caliber and potential that we have in our uh, future women workforce and use that to encourage women in STEM, um, especially my passion of, of space engineering and STEM, because they are the future generation. If we can tap into that, then we will make society all that better and able to solve the, the challenges we have facing us. In fact, in, in Space research organization as well. Women scientists are gradually outnumbering men. Uh, they have not yet reached that stage, but it's, it's the trend. Yes. And uh, the Prime Minister of India has also expressed happiness about it. And uh, in the recent uh, Chandrayaan 3 mission as well, uh, several senior uh, uh, scientists were women. Your word will be a great you know, inspiration for uh, the future generation, especially among women. Uh, girls, students to come into uh, space science. What advice would you like to give to young students, especially girls, to become space scientists and uh, uh, aerospace engineers? I have a three-part piece of advice that I'd like to give the future generation. First is to really know yourself. Figure out what you are passionate about, where your curiosity lies, and then what your strengths and weaknesses are. Use this to determine what your path should be, your journey, instead of trying to copy somebody else's. The second is to create a very good support system for yourself. There will always be challenges in any journey, and having a good support system often is the thing that tips it in allowing us the motivation and, and enabling us to have the perseverance to continue in that path. Uh, and then the final part is to actively do your best. Not all opportunities are clearly marked, and sometimes it takes the initiative to ask for something, to make a query, uh, but you never know where that query will go. And even if sometimes the answer is no, if you never ask, the answer is always no. So if you take the initiative to actively do your best, uh, even if you may not know where it leads, as long as you're true to who you are and what your goals are, you will make progress towards those. Most of the technologies, emerging technologies, are being backed by uh, space science and technology, like use of satellites, I think what you're trying to ask is space exploration and space technology isn't limited to scientific exploration outside Earth. The fact that we have satellites has actually greatly benefited those here on Earth. You know, the creation of, of the global positioning system with those satellites has allowed us to use locations to, to have a, a numerous positive impact here on Earth. There are many technologies like that where they were initially created for space, but then have had spin-off benefits here on Earth. And I expect that trend to, to continue because space helps us solve these hard problems in a very challenging environment, be it miniaturization or radiation tolerance or um, environmental rigidity. And once we develop those robust systems for space, their ability to then be incorporated into things here on Earth um, that allow them to survive in those uh, opportunities here is, is very high. Thank you so much for the quality time you have shared with us uh, amidst your tight schedule. Thank you so much once again. Thank you very much.